In this video, we're going to look at some examples of how to calculate the hydraulic thrust on curved surfaces. In part one of this video, we considered a curved surface which is part of a wall submerged in a fluid. We examined the thrust on the curved part of the wall, i.e. the red area highlighted here. Because we're only going to use this method for cases where the shape is uniform in the z direction, we performed our analysis in the xy plane. The method I derived treated the horizontal and vertical thrusts separately. We found that the horizontal component of thrust could be obtained by projecting our curved surface onto an imaginary vertical surface, and that its magnitude was given by rho g h bar times a b where h-bar is the centre of gravity of the projected surface, and a-v the area of that surface. We also saw that we could use the pressure prism method to calculate the horizontal thrust, since we know that the volume of the pressure prism is equivalent to the hydraulic thrust on the imaginary surface. This method is useful because it also tells us about the line of application of force, since this goes through the centre of gravity of the pressure prism. In the case of the vertical thrust, we saw that its magnitude is equal to the weight of the fluid in the prism of fluid between the surface we are interested in and the free surface of the fluid. The line of application of the thrust goes through the centre of gravity of this prism of fluid. The direction of the vertical thrust depends on the nature of this prism. If it's a real prism, i.e. the fluid is above the surface we are interested in as shown here, then we have a downward thrust. When the fluid is below the surface of interest, this generates a virtual prism of fluid, and the vertical thrust equals the weight of the fluid that would fill that virtual prism. To generate the virtual prism of fluid, we have to visualise an imaginary fluid surface at the same level as the free surface of the fluid. The thrust in this case acts upward through the centre of gravity of the virtual prism of fluid. Finally, we saw that the total thrust is simply the vector sum of the two components. Let's look first at a wall which is a plane surface at an angle theta to the horizontal, with water sitting below the surface of the wall. In this case, since the wall is a plane surface, we can calculate the force directly. We know that the magnitude of the force equals the pressure at the centre of gravity of the wall, which is a half d below the surface, times the area of the wall. The length of the wall is d over sine theta, thus f equals rho g times a half d times b times d over sine theta, where b is the width of the wall, giving us f equals a half rho g b d squared over sine theta. We also know that the force will act perpendicular to the wall and will act through a point at a depth two-thirds d from the water surface. However, the point here is to use the method developed earlier. So we will calculate first the horizontal and then the vertical component of the force. We can then compare results obtained using both methods. To calculate the horizontal component of force, we first create a vertical projection of the surface which is the purple line shown here. The equation for the force is fx equals rho g h bar times a v. In this case, h bar will be a half d and a v will be d times the width, giving us a half rho g b d squared, where b is the width of the wall. Equivalently, we could calculate the volume of the pressure prism shown here, which of course would give us the same answer. For the vertical component of the force, we calculate the weight of the fluid in the virtual prism of water shown here, which is simply rho g times the volume of the prism. The prism has width d over tan theta and height d, so the area of the triangle is a half d squared over tan theta, which means the vertical component of the force is a half rho g b d squared over tan theta. The magnitude of the total thrust is thus a half rho g b d squared times the square root of 1 plus 1 over tan squared theta, which yields a half rho g b d squared over sine theta, 
which agrees with what we obtained using the Barrett method. Finally, the line of incidence of the hydraulic thrust is calculated by finding the centre of gravity of the virtual prism of water and of the pressure prism. In this case, both are triangles, so it's straightforward, since the centre of gravity of a triangle is one third of the height from the base of the triangle. In this example, we have a curved overhang, and we want to know the resultant force on the whole wall, i.e. from the fluid surface to the bottom. The horizontal component is simple, since our horizontal projection generates a vertical surface spanning the whole depth of the fluid. The horizontal component of thrust is thus a half rho g b d squared, where b is the width of the wall, as in the previous example. The vertical component will be an upthrust equal to the weight of the fluid that would fill the virtual prism of water above the overhang. Let's go back to our original example and suppose we want to calculate the thrust on the curved part of the wall highlighted here in yellow. Remember we are assuming the shape has a uniform curvature in the third dimension or the z direction. For the horizontal component of force we project the curve onto the imaginary vertical surface shown here in purple. Provided we know the values of a and d as shown here is straightforward to find the centre of gravity of the projected surface. It will simply be a plus a half d below the fluid surface. The area of the projected surface will be its height d times the width of the semicircular projection we are interested in. So the magnitude of the horizontal component of the force, fx, is rho g times a plus a half d times d times the width. We could also calculate this using the pressure prism method, in which the magnitude of fx is the volume of the pressure prism shown here. If we remind ourselves of what the pressure distribution looks like, we can see that the pressure on the upper part of the surface has vertical components of pressure acting downward, while the lower part has vertical components of pressure acting upwards. Thus, for the vertical component of force, we need to break our surface down into two parts, that with fluid above it and that with fluid below, shown in yellow and red respectively here. If we consider first the yellow part with fluid above it, we have a real prism of fluid above it resulting in a downward thrust equal to the weight of the fluid in the prism. Setting that to one side, at the part of the curve with fluid below it, the red part, we have a virtual prism of water resulting in an upthrust with magnitude equal to the weight of fluid in the virtual prism. To calculate the resultant thrust, we simply add these two forces together. We thus get an upthrust equal in magnitude to the weight of the fluid in the virtual prism filling the shape of the curve as illustrated here. Assuming this is a semicircle with diameter d, this gives an upthrust equal to rho g times a half times a quarter pi d squared times the width. What if we have a semicircular indent as opposed to a protuberance? A horizontal component of thrust is as it was before, so I'll consider only the vertical component here. In this case, we again need to look separately at the upper and lower part of the semicircle. For the upper half of the semicircular surface, we will have an upthrust with magnitude equal to the weight of the virtual prism of fluid above the semicircle. For the lower half, we have a downward thrust equal to the weight of the virtual prism of fluid above the lower semicircle. The resultant vertical thrust is thus a downward thrust with magnitude equal to the weight of the real prism of fluid in the semicircle. We can apply this method of combining vertical thrusts to all sorts of shapes. Here is one last example, with fluid below one part of the surface and fluid above another part. The methodology is the same. We have an upthrust with magnitude equal to the weight of the virtual prism of fluid above the diagonal plane surface, and we have a downward thrust 
with magnitude equal to the weight of the virtual prism of fluid above the semicircle. The resultant vertical thrust will thus be the sum of the two thrusts shown in this diagram. 